In the previous video, we took a look at foundationalism. And one of the things we saw is that if foundationalism wants to do justice to like the everyday beliefs that we have about the world around us, then presumably one of the bases, like one of the foundations of our beliefs are going to have to be experiences, perceptions, observations. Um, it's got to be the episodes where we see something that are prime examples of beliefs that are justified without any inference going on, right? Because that's what foundationalism is telling us, that there are beliefs that are non-inferentially justified. They're justified in some other way, not based on other beliefs. And the prime candidate, or at least one of the prime candidates, has to be sense experience, observation, perception. Now, in this video, what I want to do is I want to make trouble for foundationalism about sense experience using ideas from a famous article written by the American philosopher Wilfred Sellers. The article is called Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind. It is very long. It is very difficult um, and it is very rich. So I will not talk about everything that is going on in this article. Uh, in fact, I will talk about only one strand of thought um, and not in that much depth either. But it's going to help us think through why foundationalism about observations might be problematic, right? Why it might not be, uh, I mean, it might seem, seem obvious or intuitive that when we look around, we just see things, we just know that they're true. Um, there is no other beliefs involved. That might seem obvious. I'm going to try to argue using Sellers that it isn't obvious. Now, in Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, Sellers launches a term, uh, a phrase, namely the phrase, the myth of the given. The myth of the given. And so what Sellers is going to try to do, well, he's going to talk about something called the given, and he believes that lots of philosophers believe in the given, and he is going to try to argue that it's a myth, that there is no given in the sense that philosophers believe in this. So what is a given? Well, a given would be something that we sort of just get, right? We don't have to, in a sense, do any thought thing for it. Specifically, we don't have to sort of take up any kind of normative stance, make any kind of epistemic decision, uh, apply any kind of epistemic criterion of which it could then be asked whether we did it correctly or incorrectly, whether that was right or wrong and so forth. So the given is something that like unlike, let's say, the result of an inference, I mean, that's not given, that's something that we have to do and about which there are then questions, right? I mean, did we do it well? Um, were we justified in doing it the way that we did it? The given is not like that. It's just there, it just happens to us, so to speak. But, I mean, that by itself doesn't yet make it the given. It also needs to have another property, which is that it can serve as the basis for justifying other beliefs, right? So the given is something that's given to us, um, like we don't need to use any, any sort of epistemic procedures to get there, but once we have it, it can serve as the basis for the justification of other beliefs. So a prime example of the given, the example that I'm going to be interested in uh, in this lecture, and in fact, the example that Sellers himself is most, most interested in, is precisely the kind of experience, sense experience, that the foundationalist is positing. So what the foundationalist is positing is that when I look at the world, right, something just happens, right, I don't have to do any reasoning, I don't have to sort of make any epistemic moves about which the question of right and wrong comes up, no. When I look at the world, something just happens, something is just given to me, that can then be the basis of my other beliefs about the world, right? That can then function as a, a justifier of other things. So what Sellers is going to do and what other people who criticize the myth of the given would follow Sellers in doing is saying that those two properties of the given just can't come together, right? Yes, you can have things that are just given to us where we don't use any epistemic moves. And yes, you can have things that serve as the basis of justification for other things, right? That's what all our beliefs are. You can't have something that is both. 
And really what one way of thinking about this is that Sellers points out that it's a bit of a strange thing, this foundationalist sense experience. You know, on the one hand, it's something that, that happens, that just is there, it's like an event in the world, it's like completely objective in a certain sense. Um, it just is, right? Just like events in the world that they just are. But on the other hand, it has normative implications, right? It's also a bit like a judgment, like um, something that we embrace, something that we are responsible for, something that has implications for what we ought to do, right? We ought to do this, we ought to believe that, we ought not to believe that. And so here we have on the one hand, a, like a purely natural just occurrence, something that just is, which at the same time, functions like a normative thing, like a judgment, like something that makes it the case that we ought to do one thing or, or another. Now, here's the question, right? Can sense experience fulfill both of those roles at the same time? And it may seem, yeah, sure, right? You look around and let's say that you look around and what you see is you see a brown table. Right? And so here's something that you could think. You'd think, look, on the one hand, something is just happening to me. I'm seeing this brown table. Well, when I see this brown table, of course, now I have to believe certain things, right? Uh, I believe that there's a brown table, and I also have to believe that there's at least one table here, and I have to believe that there's at least one brown thing here, and I have to believe that uh, tables can be brown, and I have to believe that, you know, I could put things on a table in this room and so on and so forth, right? This has all these, all these implications. Uh, there are all these other beliefs that are justified by the experience. Okay, here's what Sellers does. Sellers points out that the story I've just been telling, I quickly skipped over an ambiguity, right? I quickly skipped over an ambiguity. Well, what ambiguity? Okay, on the one hand, there is seeing a brown table, right? Seeing a brown table. On the other hand, there is, well, actually we can fill in several things here, but let's take this one. There is seeing that the table is brown, right? Let's take these two things. Let's, let me say it again. Seeing a brown table, seeing that the table is brown, right? What is involved in seeing a brown table? Well, frankly, not much, right? You've got to have your eyes open. You've got to be conscious and light from the table has to sort of stream into your eyes. Um, then you're seeing a brown table, right? You might not be paying special attention to it. Uh, you might not be noticing that it's a table. You might not be noticing that it's brown. Uh, in a sense, maybe you, you, you don't maybe even have the concept of a table or the concept of brown, right? If you come from a society where there are no tables, and you've never heard of tables, you can still walk into my room and see the brown table, right? But you won't be seeing that, that it's a brown table. You won't be seeing that the table is brown. You won't be seeing that there is a table and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing. Seeing a brown table is an event that happens to you. Maybe you need to be conscious. Maybe you need to have certain uh, like, like sense organs, but it's relatively limited in terms of what it requires of you mentally. On the other hand, seeing that the table is brown requires you to uh, have concepts, right? It requires the concept of table. It requires the concept of brown. It requires those two concepts to come together in a judgment, the judgment, the table is brown. And it requires you to ascend to that judgment, right? You've got to embrace it. There could be circumstances where you don't embrace it, right? Where you don't, you know, take up this judgment that the table is brown. Uh, maybe because you are worried that you're not seeing it correctly or something like that. What's important is that these two things are different, right? Seeing a brown table is really not the same thing as seeing that the table is brown. And this is not special about tables and brownness. This is something that holds true for like sense perception in general, right? Seeing the open door is not the same thing as seeing that the door is open um, and so on and so forth. 
And again, always, you can very easily see this by just imagining someone who doesn't have the right concepts, right? I mean, they can still see this thing or, or take an animal or a very small child, right? I mean, a very small child, a toddler can see the same things that we see, but of course they don't see that the door is open and that the, you know, coffee is being made and so on and so forth. All right, now here's the next move. The next move is that we, once we have pulled apart these two things, we show that they are two, that each of them has one of the properties that we want the given to have, right? That we want foundationalist sense experience to have. So the first thing, seeing the brown table, um, that's something that just happens, right? That's an event in the world. That's something where we don't take up any epistemic position. We don't follow any epistemic rules. It doesn't really make sense to ask whether we are mistaken or right. You know, I, it, it, if I walk into the room and I see the brown table, nobody can say, oh, you did it wrongly or you did it rightly or you made a mistake or, you know, that, that just doesn't make any sense. Right? There's just something that happens. It's just an event and events can't be mistaken or I mean that that or, or you know, justified or it's just something that happens. So seeing a red table, it has the one thing that we want from the given. This sort of neutrality, the fact that it just happens, the fact that it's given to us. The other thing. OK. Let me back up. But seeing a brown table doesn't have um, it, it, it. It doesn't serve as, as justification for anything, right? It couldn't serve as justification for anything. I mean, nothing follows from something that isn't even conceptualized, right? Seeing the brown table. I mean, that's it doesn't even involve necessarily having the concept of brown or the concept of table, I mean, how could any beliefs follow from it? How could you derive anything from it? You can't, right? That by itself can't serve as the basis for any kind of justification. All right, second thing, seeing that the table is brown. Well, that can serve as the basis for justification, right? If I see that the table is brown, I have this belief. It's conceptual. Things follow from it. I can use it in reasoning to infer other beliefs. So that's great. But it's not just given, right? It's something where I actually have applied certain epistemic rules, certain epistemic procedures. I have applied the concept of table. I have applied the concept of brown. I have apparently judged that here the concept of table does correctly apply and here the concept of brown does correctly apply. And in fact, they, they are to be combined in one judgment and that judgment is to be embraced and taken up. Um, and I might be wrong in doing that, right? Somebody could come to me and say, no, 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 no. You don't see that the table is brown. I mean, this isn't even a table. I mean, check it out, it's a bed. Or no, 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 no. It's not even brown. Check it out. I mean, there's this red light here and actually it's yellow and it just looked brown to you, right? The, the table's yellow, but under the red light, it actually looked brown. Um, so we are actually following certain epistemic rules, which we might do well or not so well. So we could be wrong. We could be criticized. Um, and in fact, we need a justification, right? I mean, we need a certain amount of justification in order to make this judgment, right? We need to be able to see and explain that, no, in this case, we were right in, you know, drawing from our, our perception in, in, in embracing sort of this judgment that, um, that the table is actually really brown. So, in fact, Sellers is going to go on to say, um, any such perceptual judgment is going to be extremely complex. Like even something as simple as the table is brown is actually a very complex judgment that requires us to know and understand a lot. And of course, I mean, if we if we if we have other perceptual judgments, like most of our perceptual judgments are way more complex than that, right? I mean, if I say, hey, there's Mary over there playing football, 
whoa, I mean, I mean, just just think of all the things that are involved in the conception of Mary, the conception of football, of playing, and so on and so forth. That's really complex. But let's take something simple, like a, a simple color judgment. Well, here's one of the things that Sellers does in his article. He tells us about a tie shop, so a shop where people sell neckties. And there's this guy called uh, Jones, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Jones sells ties, so he has green ties and blue ties, and customers come in and customers say, I want a blue tie, and, and Jones brings in a blue tie, and uh, he does this correctly. Okay, and then one day Jones, like the last person in town, he hates technology, but Jones installs finally electric light. And now he can also work in the evening hours with the electric light, but the electric light is kind of yellowish. Right? I mean, these are old fashioned bulbs, they're kind of yellowish. Um, and so things look different. Okay, so now a customer comes into the shop and uh, Jones says, and he says, I want a green tie. And Jones picks up a green tie and the customer says, that's not a green tie. And Jones says, yeah, that's a green tie. I can see that it's green. And the customer says, no, no, it's a blue tie. It just looks green in this yellowish light. And Jones says, what are you talking about? And the customer says, let's go outside. And they go outside and it's still, there's still some light in the sun. And, and Jones says, huh, I don't get it, right? The tie was green when we were inside and now it's blue. And then the customer says, I mean, that can't happen, right? I mean, ties don't change their color. And Jones is really confused. But after a while, he sort of learns that when he is inside under the electric light, he can say things like, yeah, you know, it seems it looks kind of green, but it is actually blue. I mean, that's the new thing that he comes to be able to say. So when Jones now looks at a tie and sees that it is blue, right? He doesn't just see the blue tie. He sees that it is blue. What he's actually doing is something rather complex, right? He is thinking about, maybe not consciously, but he's thinking about things like lighting conditions. Like what, am I in a situation where things have the color that they seem to have, or are there certain factors that make it seem a different way and so on and so forth. And so he has to be thinking in terms of daylight and electric light and and all that kind of stuff and how that interacts with the visual visual system and so on and so forth. And so even a fairly trivial seeming um, perceptual judgment, like the judgment, the tie is green or the tie is blue or the table is brown, like the simplest kind of judgment you can have, actually involves an ability to make a distinction between situations where things are normal, situations where things are abnormal, an ability to sort of judge which situation you're in, an ability to um, maybe compensate for the situation that you're in. So a lot of knowledge, like a lot of knowledge of concepts, a lot of knowledge of how the world works, all of that is involved in a judgment as simple as the tie is green, the tie is blue, the table is red, whatever. So, um, here is, I just want to want to read out one short Sellers quote. Here is something that Sellers says. He says, there is an important sense in which one has no concept pertaining to the observable properties of physical objects in space and time, unless one has them all, and indeed a great deal more besides. So in order to, to even talk about something like brown, you need to be able to talk about the other colors, you need to be able to talk about light, you need to be able to, you know, think through the notions of observation and circumstances and so on and so forth, um, outside and inside, this and that. Perceptual judgment is very complex. It's not given. It requires us to learn a lot. And whenever we do it, right, we can be wrong, we can be criticized, and we can give reasons. Right? There's always reasons in the background of any perceptual judgment. So here is what Sellers is telling us. Sellers is telling us that sure, we can see objects in the sort of non-conceptual sense um, just by opening our eyes, but that is not something that could serve as a basis for justification. Right? In order to have something that can serve as a basis of justification, in order to have insights, beliefs, in order to have these conceptual judgments, 
we need to apply an extremely complicated apparatus full of epistemic judgments and rules um, that can be criticized. And that is definitely not just something that happens, something that is given, right? It is something that we do. And so in another famous phrase of Sellers, the phrase, the space of reasons, uh, what Sellers tells us is that all perceptual judgment takes place in the space of reasons. And by that, he means that it's, you know, part and parcel of our intersubjective activity of asking for reasons, giving reasons, being able to justify things, and so on. So, if Sellers is right, there is no unproblematic, like, given foundation of perceptual truths that we just get and which escape um, like the entire apparatus of making epistemic judgment, making judgments, uh, thinking about what is right, what is not right, what you should believe and what you should not believe. And that would be a great boon for a coherentist story about perception uh, and experience and a great, well, anti-boon, a problem for foundationalist stories about perception. So let me say only one more thing here. Uh, the one more thing I want to say is that you could tell stories like this, like using different different entry, like sort of different philosophical entry points. Um, you could tell something very much like this, for instance, from a Kantian perspective. So Kant talks about the difference between merely subjective sort of sensations that follow each other on the one hand and an objective experience on the other hand, right? Where I really see something um, and it's not just sort of, you know, something that subjectively happened in my mind. It's something real about the world. Now, when it's something real about the world, Kant says, that means that we experience it as following a certain rule, right? As making certain things necessary, as being under certain laws of causation. Well, that's really complex, right? A lot of judgment is already in there. Uh, we can be wrong about it. It's something where, you know, a foundationalist story where you just get experience of the world doesn't really work and so Kant would say that you know I suppose he would say that the only thing that the foundationalist can get for free is a subjective play of 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 sensations that that never rises to the level of information about an external world right a world of objects that exist apart from the sensations um and you know you can you can take that story and again suggest that that what the foundationalist believes you can get in perception isn't really there even when we just look at the world we are already actively engaged in thinking about it trying to judge it trying to find out how things are and that's an activity that is already you know it's already at every point possible for us to do it right, to do it wrong. Um, we are already in the space of reasons where well, we have to be able to say why we did something, why we came to a certain conclusion. Okay, let me say one final, final thing. And the final, final thing is that it might, this might make you worry about like animals or very young children. I mean, can't they see the world? Well, what Sellers would say is, oh, I mean, they can see the world, but they're not dealing in epistemic justification. Right? And that seems to be right. I mean, they can see the world, it can have a causal influence on them, but of course they're not sort of giving reasons or trying to give reasons or able to give reasons um, and be justified in believing certain things in the sense that we adult human beings can be justified in believing certain things.